Five seconds to the open. Ready? Who wants to get this thing started right about now? Welcome to Follow the Money Weekly with your host, Jerry Robinson. Welcome. Not just some guru. Oh, 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 really? Your host is an economist and a best-selling author. What an interesting news item. I'd better write that down. And just someone who likes to make money and help you to make money. Welcome to Follow the Money Weekly. And here he is, Jerry Robinson. Friends, welcome to you all around the world. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio. So grateful to have you. My name is Jerry Robinson. I am your host, your guide, leading you on an excursion to truth right here on Follow the Money Radio. You can find us online at followthemoney.com. We have so many free resources available to you. Videos we've done over the years, many podcasts, gosh, probably eight years worth of podcast archives that you can dig into and some of the top financial minds we have interviewed over the years. Uh, so they're all there waiting for you, followthemoney.com. And, of course, we're on social media, on YouTube, on Twitter, and on Facebook, and on and on. Great to have you today. Today we're going to be talking about America's ticking debt bomb. It really is a ticking debt bomb when you look at the current state of the United States Economy Now, for those who have closely followed our teachings over the years, you're aware that our belief um, of America's love affair with debt and leverage is really going to lead to its ultimate undoing. We've written a book called Bankruptcy of Our Nation, and hopefully you have that book. If you don't, you can just go to followthemoney.com forward slash bankruptcy and get your copy. We have it in uh, paperback, and we also have it in audiobook format for those of you who prefer it that way. But it is a book I think that is so important. It's the information that I put in this book, even though I first wrote it back in 2008 and then revised it in 2012, the information in it is timeless. I mean, sure, the numbers are always changing. You look at the national debt. I can't believe when I first got uh, started railing against the national debt. It was around five or six trillion dollars. And now today, you know, it's 22 trillion dollars almost. I mean, it's insane how fast the national debt is growing. But that's what happens when you take compound interest and you reverse it against yourself, right? I mean, the inverse of compound interest is a bad negative thing. You often hear about how wonderful it is. If you can earn compound interest, they often say that uh, the great scientist Albert Einstein called compound interest the eighth wonder of the world. But what happens whenever compound interest is working against you, as it is in the case of the United States government, where it has these trillions and trillions of unpayable debt, and then it's constantly compounding at an interest rate, making it completely unsustainable to stay up with. So we believe that America's economic, but not just its economic power, its political power too, is on the decline as competing nations like China, also to a lesser extent right now India, but that will be a much bigger competitor over the next couple of decades. But both of these countries and others are on the rise, especially as we look at American weakness that has been on full display in recent years, especially in the wake, of course, of the Saudi-financed acts of terror that were committed on U.S. soil back on September 11th, 2001. Now, American weakness, economic weakness, which we've certainly seen since the 2008 crash, and then political weakness, the soft power, if you will, has been on de the decline, really, in, in recent years especially, uh, but when we look at just what's happened over the last few weeks, we can see this political weakness, this weakness in America's soft power is really uh, just declining. I mean, the, the, the weakness is, I should say, growing, but the power itself is declining. I mean, let me just give you a few examples. Number one, you may recall that uh, President Trump just recently slapped sanctions upon Iran. Uh, Iran, by the way, which is a country that is 
uh, still maintaining the nuclear deal, according to a, a new IEA, uh, IAEA report that was released, showing that Iran is still keeping the, the terms of the Iranian deal, the nuclear deal that was imposed upon them uh, by the West. And despite this, uh, Washington has ripped up the nuclear deal with Iran and has now slapped extreme, uh, tough sanctions upon Iran. But when you look at what's actually happened, when those sanctions kicked in earlier in November, you'll discover that countries like China and countries like India and Turkey and Japan and Taiwan, shall I go on? I mean, practically half of the world has ignored this, these sanctions. I mean, you, you have to go back in time to find a time whenever you know, sanctions issued by, the web, by Washington especially were just completely ignored. And Washington had to give out waivers to all of these countries because they knew they weren't going to abide by these, by these sanctions. So you have half the world almost, which is just completely thumbing its nose at Washington as it slaps sanctions upon Iran. I mean, that's, that's a sign of huge weakness just by itself. Then you may recall uh, recently that Washington has been celebrating a historic non-deal with Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea. Uh, and we've been celebrating that here in the United States. And just recently, there were reports put out um, stating that North Korea has been building secret nuclear facilities, and these have recently been discovered. And so what you have here is basically a, a threat by North Korea saying, if you don't lift sanctions against us, we're going to continue to accelerate our nuclear uh, abilities and our capabilities. I mean, that, you know, in front of the whole world, I mean, in other words, North Korea and China have basically been playing, the, you know, Washington in front of the whole world. Again, another huge, huge sign that our political power is overextended, that our, that our, you know, that our view, that how other people view us around the world is on the decline. Let's consider another example. Uh, just recently, after 17 years in Afghanistan, we've been fighting in Afghanistan now for a very long time, and in fact, in 2018, uh, so far this year, according to a new report, America has dropped more bombs on Afghanistan this year than it has any other year uh, prior, and there have been a, a large, growing number of civilian deaths in Afghanistan in 2018 as compared to previous years. And despite all of that, despite 17 years of bombing, the Taliban, people who live in caves and in, you know, in medieval kind of circumstances in Afghanistan, who have obviously weapons that are strong, but not nearly as strong as the massive military of the United States, a top U.S. commander over Afghanistan just recently admitted a mil military defeat. He said, we cannot beat the Taliban. I mean, this is the world's largest military by budget, whether you look at the budget, and we got a busted bu budget to prove the fact that we have the largest military in world history. But the, the fact that a top U.S. military commander over Afghanistan would just simply wave the white flag and say, it's over, guys. We can't beat the Taliban. We can't beat these guys, you know, living in K. You just, I mean, that, that's, that's another huge example of the fact that America, though it has a lot of clout economically and politically, you can see that it is on the decline. And that's the point uh, that I'm trying to stress in this podcast is that it's difficult to recall a time in recent memory, when Washington looked more weak on the world stage. So we anticipate that America's growing economic and political weakness is going to continue with each passing year, and we believe that the torch of global power is going to be firmly passing from a fading Washington to a rising Beijing. Many people fail to appreciate China has been uh, a large economic power for the majority of world history. 
It's only been in recent times over the last couple of hundred years where China has lost that economic crown of you know, economic uh, hegemonic power. But they're rising again. And for those of us who can see the writing on the wall, we're aware that we're living in the twilight of American empire. And at the sunrise of you know, the, the rise of, uh, of the East, it's a great book written by uh, Gideon Rockman. Uh, who was a writer for The Economist magazine and, and uh, Financial Times, I believe. And he wrote a book called Easternization. I strongly recommend you pick up that book if you haven't read it. Uh, there are many, many signs uh, that we can see of this rise of China, and they're not going away. It's a very, very important uh, development in our, in our own time, and it's important for us to notice it for those of us who want to be prepared uh, for what's coming. So with all that said, last weekend, uh, the latest case in point came in a report uh, by the Wall Street Journal, and this headline was entitled, U.S. on a course to spend more on debt than defense, rising interest costs, the subtitle, rising interest costs could crowd out other government spending priorities and rattle markets. And I just want to read you a few uh, sentences from this article, and I'm going to provide a link to it in today's uh, show notes, but just but I just want you to, to to hear exactly what's actually happening. This is something that rarely makes it into the mainstream press. These are the kind of statistics that we put in our book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, and they rarely make it to the mainstream press. And what I mean by that is that they may end up in the mainstream press, but you won't get the drum beat on them. Like you know, here in the United States, when you look at the corporate media, the corporate press. I mean, they won't let go of Russia, right? The Russia Gates thing. I mean, they just keep pounding about that, right? Or, they, or they'll pound on something else. But they won't talk about the national debt over and over and over again, right? They won't talk about the corporate corruption uh, over and over and over again. They won't talk about the you know, absolute uh, you know, amount of student debt and credit card debt and mortgage debt you know, over and over and over and over. They won't do it. I mean, they'll do a story on it. But they're not going to talk about it over and over. So what they talk about over and over is that's usually what they're trying to manipulate you with. I mean, that's usually a sign, right, if when they start propagandizing you. But one thing they won't talk about over and over again is the national debt, right, and the fact that we don't have enough money to cover uh, some of the most basic expenses that we're going to have coming up in the next couple of decades. So let me read you this article. Uh, I'll just read you a few lines of it here. We'll provide a link in the show notes. This is by Kate Davidson and Daniel Kruger, uh, dateline um, November 11th, 2018. And the uh, article begins, In the past decade, U.S. debt held by the public has risen to $15.9 trillion from $5.1 trillion. But financing all of that debt hasn't been a problem. Low inflation and strong global demand for safe U.S. Treasury bonds held the government's interest costs down. That's in the process of changing. Interest rates are rising as inflation normalizes around the Federal Reserve's 2% target. That and the sheer scale of debt being accumulated by the federal government has put the U.S. on a path of rising interest costs that in the years to come could crowd out other government spending priorities and rattle markets. In 2017, Interest costs on federal debt of $263 billion accounted for 6.6% of all government spending and 1.4% of government or of gross domestic product, well below averages in the previous 50 years. The Congressional Budget Office estimates interest spending will rise to $915 billion by 2028. Let me repeat that. The CBO, which is a non or a bipartisan group, or even a nonpartisan group for that matter, estimates interest spending will rise to $915 billion a year. That's almost a trillion dollars in interest by 2028, or 13% of all outlays and 3.1% of gross domestic product. So along that line, or along that path, the article continues, the government is expected to pass the following milestones, and here's, here's the kicker. It will spend more on interest, on the national debt, of course, than it spends upon Medicaid in 2020. 
So right now when we do this program, we're in November of 2018. So 2020 is just what, a year and a half away, you know, at most two years away. It all depends what month they're talking about. Probably the beginning of the fiscal year. So you know, maybe a year and a half or two years. And if you look at that, you're saying we're going to be spending more on interest on the national debt, all of the debt we've accumulated, than we are spending on Medicaid by 2020. But it gets worse. It continues. We're going to be spending more in 2023 on interest than it spends on national defense. So in less than five years, the United States of America is projected to be spending more money servicing the debt on through interest payments on the national debt than it is on its defense budget, its bloated defense budget. You know, we have 700, 800 military bases around the world. We're fighting numerous wars that we never, rare, well, we rarely hear about in the, in the mainstream press. We don't even really realize how many wars we're in. We're fighting on numerous fronts, and it costs us an enormous amount of money to run this huge, massive warfare state. And yet, by in f- less than five years, the amount of money that we are spending on interest, not principal payments, interest on the national debt, interest on the national debt, will be spending more than the entire national defense budget. I mean, let that so less than five years. Like, this is, you know, this is unsustainable. It goes on and says, We'll be spending more on interest in 2025 than the government spends on all non-defense discretionary programs combined, from funding for national parks to scientific research to healthcare, education to the court system and infrastructure, and all of that, by the way, according to the CBO, the CBO, which is the Congressional Budget Office. I mean, it's just an astonishing article, an astonishing report from the CBO, just a constant reminder that, you know, we are in over our heads here in America, and we just don't, we don't seem to appreciate the situation that we're in, the precarious situation that the U.S. economy is facing. There's a few more key takeaways from this report. Uh, one of them is that over the next five or six years, about 70% of the federal debt uh, will mature will need to be refinanced at these current higher interest rates. So as interest rates are rising, we're getting ready to see a large portion of the public debt have to be refinanced. And so that means the interest costs, of course, are going to rise. And then secondly, uh, another key takeaway from this report is that the U.S. Treasury is set to issue twice as much debt this year, 2018, as it did in 2017, according to the Treasury Department borrowing estimates. So the Treasury Department is just borrowing at an unbelievable rate. It is taking extraordinary measures just to keep the government going. The government is obviously getting a bunch of tax revenue now. In fact, government revenue is is near an all-time high. But that doesn't help the fact that we are not, we still don't have enough money to pay our bills. So we have to borrow more and more money, even though we have record revenue coming in. So, you know, I think I, I think the, the, the key thing to take away from this is that America's ticking debt bomb is months, not decades away, right? We, we, we would love to think that we have until 2040 or 2050 before things begin to go up in flames. But it's very clear from the CBO that unless something drastic changes, something drastic changes over the next few years, over the next 24, 36 months, that we're going to be facing a very, very big issue that politicians are still not talking about. Right? They're not. They're not talking about this at all. They're talking about the migrant caravan, right? They're talking about things that you know that really, when you when you really boil it down, these are things that are that are not existential threats. Um, that these are things that can be dealt with. We're not dealing with the things that we have to deal with right we're looking for other things we're getting distracted by every other possible thing and not paying attention to the most obvious problems in our own house that we've got to deal with so you know it's and the, i think the other thing to keep in mind here is that as all of this is happening 
you know, a rising China is patiently waiting in the wings to take the reins. If you look in uh, at the GDP uh, on a PPP basis, purchasing power parity, you'll discover that China became the largest economy by that metric uh, four years ago in 2014. Didn't make a lot of noise in the media. You didn't hear a whole lot about it. But China became the largest economy on a GDP PPP basis um, in 2014. And the United States doesn't like to use that metric, of course, because it shows that they're weaker than, than China. So they use a GDP and constant dollars approach, uh, which makes them look bigger on paper. But in reality, all things being equal, the Chinese economy is already larger than the, than the United States economy. Right? And the United States is just living in denial about that, thinking that they can still dictate to China. They can tell China that China can't navigate in the China Sea. Uh, they think that they can boss China around and tell China what to do. But in reality, China is growing stronger and stronger by the day. And America is continuing to lose its market share globally through its through dollar demand and much more. So you know, for those who are insistent that the economy is so good right now, I mean, somebody might point and say, look, Jerry, that, you know, uh, uh, if you look at uh, unemployment, you know, it's at a 49 year low, or they may point to the GDP numbers, which came in recently at about 3.5% on an annualized basis last quarter. And they may say, look, you know, America is doing great. Economically, we're doing fantastic. Well, my question is simply this. If the economy is so good, then why isn't the national debt going down? Right? Why does it just keep going up? If the economy is so good, how come we can't afford to pay our bills without borrowing money every year? Right? If, if the economy is so great in 2018 right now, then why are we facing astronomical twin deficits, a trade deficit? They just won't go away no matter what Washington does. I mean, Washington is now literally slapping taxes, known as tariffs, on U.S. consumers to buy Chinese goods, and, China, and China's exports are still rising. So, And on top of that, we have a budget deficit that is outrageous. If the economy is so good, why are we facing those twin deficits? If the economy is so great, why is mortgage debt and credit card debt and student loan debt at or near all-time highs. It doesn't make any sense. You know, facts are stubborn things. And here's one fact that, the, that Washington has been pretty mum on. And that is that the fact they have no plan to pay off the national debt. Did you know that? They have no plan to balance the budget. Oh, they talk big about it. They'll talk about how they will whenever they're campaigning, right? Whenever they're trying to get elected, they'll sell you the moon. But whenever they finally get into office, guess what? They don't have a plan to pay off the national debt. They're not going to pay off the national debt. Neither party has a plan. Either party has a plan. Sometimes I get frustrated whenever I look at the, at the uh, Republican and Democrat uh, parties and I see how people really take a side. You know, they really think that, oh, Republicans are going to save us or Democrats are going to save us. You know, if we could just get them elected just one more time, if we'll one more time, we'll, we'll believe it one more time. And every time, what do they do? They let you down, don't they? It's time to, to stop believing that you have a choice, friends. You don't have a choice. Republicans and Democrats are funded by the same people. And it's not you. It's the corporations who run this country, right? I mean, this, for all intents and purposes, we live in a corporate-run country. Corporations are people, according to the Supreme Court, Citizens United. And they have free speech, and their free speech is money, right? And so they control the Republicans, and they control the Democrats. The Democrats and Republicans are not looking out for you. Nobody, nobody, these guys in Washington don't care if you die in a ditch, right? The only, thing, the only reason they would care is because you'd stop paying taxes, they're not looking out for you. They're looking out for their crony. They're, they're looking out for their crony buddies. They're looking out for corporations. I mean, it's almost like when I look at politics, like Repu Republicans and Democrats, you know, bickering and arguing, I, I, I think of like the WWF. Whenever I was a kid, uh, I was subjected to watching, you know, wrestling as, <laughs> as it was called, as it was called 
uh, at the time. I would go over to my aunt and uncle sometimes, and boy, they loved wrestling, right? And boy, you'd watch it and you think, man, this stuff is, you know, if you're a kid, you think, well, this is, this looks kind of real, you know? I mean, this guy's all mad and he's getting ready to take somebody down and he's going to, you know, take a chair and bust his head. And you think, gosh, this is so real and they're so angry. And, but then you, you realize, oh, wait a minute, that, that's all makeup, right? That's all lights, camera, action. You realize, wait a minute, that's, and I know I'm bursting some of your bubbles out there that still think wrestling is real, but, but, but believe me, it's not. It's actually acting, right? And, you know, for most people, we can laugh at that. And we can say, yeah, you know, wrestling, of course, yeah, that's, that's acting. But then we think Republicans and Democrats, now that's a different story, right? Those guys are really at each other. They really want to take each other down. They really don't work for the same master. They really don't have the same corporate sponsors. They really are looking out for us. Yeah, sure. You can believe that all you want to, but that's not going to make it true. That's not going to make it true. In reality, neither party, Republican or Democrat, have a plan to pay off the national debt. Period. That's the fact. The Republicans borrow and spend, while the Democrats tax and spend. Right? Meanwhile, neither of them have a plan for paying off America's unsustainable debt. They'll tell you they do when they're campaigning, but they won't do it when they get into office. You know, the day of reckoning is coming. It's coming indeed. Eventually, foreign investors will no longer be interested in buying U.S. government bonds to prop up our unsustainable debt loads. They won't be interested in in continuing to allow us to have our military bases abroad. And one of the things you're going to see is military bases are likely going to be cut at some point. And that's going to be a big sign to you and I that the government literally is running out of options. When they start closing down these seven or 800 military bases around the world, they're probably going to do it quietly. But you know it's going to end up in the press, at least in foreign press. And that's going to be a negative day, and it's going to be an admission by the U.S. empire that it cannot continue to prop up this unsustainable uh, government. Makes you wonder if America even learned anything from the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, you know, back in 2008, 2009, the people woke up and they were like, "Wait a minute, you know what happened to our economy?" And there was anger in the streets. And at that time, there was a great desire on the part of part of the country to pay off the national debt, right? We saw that. Now, I have a feeling now that, you know, of course, we look back for the last couple of years and Republicans have controlled the House, the Senate, the White House. And now that the Democrats are back in control of the House, thanks to the midterms, I have a feeling, just a little sneaky suspicion, that the GOP is going to return to some of its old-time religion about preaching spending cuts. Maybe. Maybe, maybe that's just wishful thinking. But usually that's how it works. Um, but the, you know, really, when you think about it, the only incentive that a politician has in this country is election and re-election. So therefore, as long as they're re-elected, they're going to say whatever it takes to get re-elected. And then, and then as far as doing the actual spending cuts, that's a sure way to actually lose your position. Uh, as a politician, you start cutting spending and, you know, your time is almost up, buddy. It's not going to last too long. So so let's try to wrap this up a little bit because I, I want to bring this to a conclusion or also an actionable conclusion because we don't want to bring all this information up without providing you with a strategy. You know, there are currently four ways that America can solve its debt crisis. Four ways. The first thing that it can do is it could cut spending. We were just talking about that. Uh, we have a lot of revenue coming in. People are paying a lot of taxes right now. In fact, the tax load, even despite the tax cuts that were passed by President Trump uh, a couple, uh, you know, just a few uh, months ago or about a year ago or so, those tax cuts, despite those tax cuts, Americans are paying an outrageous amount of taxes relative to to what we were paying at the beginning or foundation of this country, America. All right, regardless, though, what first thing you can do is you can cut spending, right? The question is on what? What are you going to cut spending on? And I tell you, one of the largest areas you could cut spending on is the Pentagon. You know, Pentagon needs to be audited. we got all these wars going on around the world. 
We have 800 military bases spread out all over the world for, you know, for, for who knows what. Audit the Pentagon. You want to find a bunch of money? You want to find a bunch of money to take care of issues here in this country? Audit the Pentagon. I tell you what, you'll find a bunch of money in that piggy bank, a bunch of money that's likely being squandered and wasted. Uh, that's a great place to start. There's a number of places you could look to cut spending, but I would start with the, that uh, Pentagon building right there uh, near Washington, D.C. I tell you what, you could find a bunch of money in that place to start you know, cutting spending here in the United States. Number two, uh, another thing you could do is you could raise taxes. And, of course, that's politically suicidal, just as cutting spending is. I mean, neither party wants to cut spending. In fact, they're not. Of course, you can see that neither one of them are cutting spending, uh, even though one party claims to be a, 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 uh, you know, against spending and overspending. You haven't seen them stop at all. It's been a spending spree in 2018. But the other thing that's suicidal is to raise taxes, right? So you can't do that. Uh, politicians won't get reelected if they raise taxes. And so you can't do that uh, according to, to uh, the, the whole incentive for politicians. Now, we know that you could raise taxes uh, on corporations. You could raise taxes upon the rich, right, as many people would like to see. But again, that's not going to happen uh, short of people getting, you know, uh, kicked out of office. And so there's going to have to be a real big sea change here in the United States, to ever see that come to fruition. Uh, number three, you can borrow money. That's what the Treasury is already doing now. It's borrowing money hand over fist using extraordinary measures just to cover its expenses. Uh, so we're already borrowing. Are we going to borrow claims? I mean, we just keep borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. And then the, 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 fourth, the fourth thing that you can do is you could print money, right? And that's exactly how nations go down in flames. That's how Weimar Republic went down in flames. That's how many other nations throughout history, Venezuela, for example, currently going through that hyperinflation right now. And at some point, that'll be the only option because politicians will say, look, if we cut spending, we get kicked out of office. If we raise taxes, we get kicked out of office. And guess what? We can't borrow from anybody else anymore because they don't trust us. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to print money. And of course, that's what Washington is going to do. That's what every other previous empire that has had the ability uh, has done. And so we're not surprised if that happens. It will not be a surprise at all. And this is why we have long urged our listeners to have a financial plan, which includes a core position in hard assets that cannot be printed at will, like paper class. Instead, we like and have a core position in gold. We have a core position in gold and also in silver because we believe that those two asset classes will survive the breakdown of America's economy. Those two asset classes have long been viewed as money. We think that having a core position in those is vital. Uh, so we like gold. We like silver. You know what else we love is affordable housing. If you have the ability to invest in real estate that is affordable real estate, I'm not talking about going out and buying these McMansions and then trying to flip them. I'm talking about buying a cheap three-bedroom, two-bathroom house in a working man's neighborhood, right? In a blue-collar neighborhood or, a, or to, to purchase a duplex, for example, or a fourplex in a, same, in a similar... I mean, that's one of our favorite investments and... You know, of course, you get the benefits of having the tax, well, of course, you get all the tax benefits with real estate, but you can also know that the politicians are very unlikely to ever take away those tax benefits because, again, that's another quick way to get kicked out of office. They take care of the rich. And so if you want to be cautious with the money that you have, invest like the rich because you can always count on Washington to protect the rich, not the poor. They're going to hose the poor. They always have hosed the poor. But they're going to take care of the rich. And so if you want to be, if you want to have some security in your investing, you invest like the rich. I mean, the majority of the rich own the stock market, right? So, the, so, Wall, or so Wall Street's always going to be protected by the, uh, the powers that be in Washington. Real estate is largely owned by the rich. 
Therefore, and I'm talking about investment real estate. Therefore, it's always going to be protected, you know, by the, or not always, we shouldn't use the word always, but, you know, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be favored by Washington. So affordable housing as a part of a rental real estate portfolio is a fantastic thing to do. We get we get emails here all the time. In fact, we just got one earlier this week from a guy who was one of our members, and he's been going through many of our video lessons that we teach on different strategies that you can take to you know create multiple streams of income, to boost your financial situation, to take care of your family, and your and you know just to just to be prepared. Uh, he had he was uh, purchasing, I believe, a duplex or looking at purchasing a duplex and. I love receiving those emails because people are actually taking action, right? They're not worried. They're not sitting around fretting about what people in Washington are doing that they have no power over. They're just saying, look, I'm going to take the reins in my own hand. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take action. And I respect that. I respect people who take action and who don't fret over things that they can't change. So affordable housing is a part of a rental real estate portfolio we love. We love that idea. And then for those who are even more aggressive, who say, you know, gold, silver, real estate, you know, all of that sounds great, but I, I want to go even further. I want to get more aggressive. Well, we stress the power of learning two more key skills. And that is one, how to trend trade stocks and ETFs so that in any kind of environment, you can make money by trading stocks or ETFs. I mean, it's a very, very powerful income stream that you can create. Anybody who has a 401k or an IRA can then begin to trend trade with that money that they have. And even if you have, you know, maybe if you don't have that, if you just have a simple brokerage account, you can learn how to trend trade. It's a skill that you'll learn and that you can use from anywhere as long as you have a, a you know, as long as you have an internet connection. So it's a powerful skill that we teach our members here is how to trend trade stocks and ETFs. And then secondly, we also teach the importance of learning how to create an online income. I mean, let's face it, you know, the world is online today and you may have always desired to start a business. You may have said, hey, I'd love eventually to start a business. Well, online is where you want to be because that's where the majority of people are and the startup costs are so low. So those are two more, you know, are really uh, for those who are more aggressive and say, I want to take this thing further. I want to really, you know, soup up my financial plan, trend trading stocks and ETFs and creating online income, those are two things that we really stress for our members here at followthemoney.com. Uh, not everybody has time to learn these additional money-making skills. You know, I admit that. I mean, you know, it's, it's not possible for everybody. But for those who do, we offer here at followthemoney.com a powerful set of video lessons uh, for our premium members. So, friends, the, the writing is on the wall, and the choice is entirely up to you. Will you simply stand passively by and watch America cave in due to its massive debt loads? Or will you seek to take action to protect yourself and your family from the impending threats of a nation that has been built entirely upon debt and leverage? It's up to you. It's your move. Are you prepared for the next stock market crash? It's not too late to protect yourself and your family with Jerry Robinson's best-selling book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, now in a new audiobook format. Whether you want to listen in the car, at the gym, or on your iPad, we've got you covered. Get the entire 300-page book in audio format for only $24.95. That's over 12 hours of Jerry Robinson's economic wisdom, financial insights, and practical money-making strategies for only $24.95. Inside this new audiobook, you'll learn 21 profitable income streams you can create both now and in retirement, along with unique tips on how to inflation-proof your investment portfolio using our own PACE philosophy and our five levels of financial freedom, which is Jerry Robinson's personal blueprint for building true wealth. If your goal is to become a better investor, increase your income, or just understand what is really happening in the global economy, you cannot afford to miss out on the vital information that is jam-packed into this 12-hour audio book. Get instant access to Bankruptcy of Our Nation in audio format right now by going online to www.ftmdaily.com slash bankruptcy. That's ftmdaily.com slash bankruptcy. Download your copy today and get on the fast track to true wealth 
and a lifetime of financial security. Hey friends, this is Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly. Recently, we have been receiving many emails from our listeners commenting on the great help they're getting from our precious metals expert, Tom Cloud. Gold and silver are excellent hedges against the growing threat of coming U.S. inflation. Who's your gold guy? Make it Tom Cloud. With over 30 years' experience with precious metals, Tom will answer all of your questions. Don't buy your gold and silver through some call center and pay inflated prices. Call my good friend Tom Cloud and speak directly with him and get all of your questions answered. For a limited time, Tom is offering free shipping and insurance on every gold and silver purchase made by our listeners. Call 800 247 2812. And when you do, tell him that Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly sent you. And he'll throw in that free shipping and insurance on your entire order. Call your gold guy, Tom Cloud, right now for the very best deals on gold and silver coins. 800-247-2812. That is 800-247-2812. All right, welcome back to the program, friends. Great to have you here. Follow the Money Radio. I was just recently on another podcast, and we were talking about a lot of the things we were talking about earlier on this podcast about the you know the national debt and the you know just the what we really see around the world is just kind of a, a certainly a decline in U.S. soft power. Well. You may be wondering, how do you actually play that? You know, and how do you actually use that to your advantage uh, as a trader or an investor? And that's actually what this uh, podcast, this little snippet I want to play from you from another podcast where I was interviewed on is really all about. So let's just kick back before we close out our program and listen to this briefly, this brief clip from another podcast I was on. It was called Crush the Street. Let's listen to that right now. How does this play into trend trading? Um, is Does any of this play into the way you see the markets and the, the way you're positioning your investments? Because I mean, that's really the scoreboard in a certain way. I mean, you know, we, we have all these ideas of, of what is going on in our politics and what people are doing, what they're likely to do, what governments are likely to do, um, what's likely to happen based on previous historic imbalances. You know, how does this play with, you know, where you're positioning your money and how you expect it to go on in the future. So uh, just, just for example, the most recent uh, implosion we saw in the stock market over the last month or so, where, where we saw tech stocks get hammered, we saw a general sell-off in the market across the board. Uh, according to some metrics, you know, worst, uh, the worst uh, sell-off we've seen on a monthly basis since back in the 2008 crash. Uh, this was a great month for us. It was a great month for our members because as trend traders, uh, we don't have any conviction at all whatsoever when it comes to the market. We're not, uh, we don't believe anything. Uh, we, have, we come to it with no beliefs at all whatsoever. We are agnostic towards the market. If the market is rising and it has support, then we use that support to, to ride the trend. Uh, if the if the trend begins to go down, then we use the resistance as an area for a stop loss and we begin to short. And so we were able to take advantage of this massive uh, sell-off we've seen over the last uh, several weeks uh, by alerting our members, our paid members, you know, our premium members to what we were doing. And so we were shorting this market using 3X inverse e- ETFs, uh, specifically on the NASDAQ also on emerging markets, also on the Dow, and some of our members were shorting semiconductors as well. I mean, we, we were really shorting the market. And then we, then we suddenly turned uh, bullish just a couple of days ago and gave our members that same uh, alert. And we told them that the market looks oversold here. It looks like we have found an area of support. And so therefore, let's go in long. And we've been right now for a few days. And, but, we, but we simply let the market tell us uh, what it's wanting to do. The market is really just a reflection 
of expectations. It's really nothing more than that. It's certainly not the economy. The stock market has nothing to do uh, you know, with uh, telling us what the economy is saying. It's really more about expectations of earnings and expectations uh, of other things. But it's a, uh, and so it's for, for trend traders, I think this is a, the kind of environment you look for. You look for an, an environment where you have, uh, you know, lots of movement, but we would generally prefer a more stable trend. And so for the last several years, trend trading has been wonderful because the market has been in a long-term uptrend and it's, it still is, by the way, according to our metrics. And so the bias is still to the upside until we break down below more resistance or uh, support levels. And so, you know, trend trading, I think, is a great way to be uh, viewing this market um, with the portion of money that you want to trade. Uh, if you are, you know, of course, there's always that portion of money where you're just buying and holding for the long term. You know, we're always looking, you know, I was just talking to somebody recently about, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, many people bought Walmart way back in the, in the 1970s, you know, because they saw the writing on the wall. They saw Sam Walton. They said, this guy knows what he's doing. And so they began investing in his company. And sure enough, if you had held that for 30 years, then you're going to beat the snot out of a, you know, out of a trend trader who's just trying to make money that week. I mean, so you do have your long-term money that you're looking for. And I think in this environment, Kenneth, the two areas that we really gravitate towards, I mean, our Walmart moment, if you know, here we are in 2018, let's say you're talking to a 30 or a 25 or a 35 year old who's saying, man, where do I stuff money for 30 years? Where do I put it? Where, where's the Walmart stock that I should be investing in? Well, you need to talk to a trusted financial advisor, of course. But from our perspective, uh, we like two areas in particular. We think over the next 30 years, uh, uh, two areas that we absolutely positively think will excel over that time frame are cryptocurrencies, which we have been long on since 2012. And when we started first buying Bitcoin and telling our members to buy Bitcoin, and then also uh, uh, cannabis, the cannabis uh, stocks. So cannabis and cryptos to, to us for the next 30 years, uh, your grandkids will not believe that you had the opportunity, uh, in my opinion, to buy some of these names in the crypto space and also in the cannabis space for the prices that we see today. They're not going to, they simply would not believe that you had access to it. And sadly, because we get so wrapped up in the micro and we get so wrapped up in the day-to-day and the news cycle, the 24-7 news cycle, oftentimes we don't have the, the patience to think out that long. But when it comes to those kinds of investments, that's what we're looking at. But when it comes to trend trading, you know, you just kind of follow the pulse of the market. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, we've covered cryptocurrency here across the street and We've been pounding the table very hard in, at the cannabis space. And, you know, you don't have the, the anheuser Bushes yet or the Constellation brands of the cannabis space yet. You know, these stocks that you would otherwise, you know, put your money in as almost like a safe haven, like an anheuser Bush. you know, oh, it's going to be around in 200 years, for instance. And, and uh, that hasn't even been fully defined yet. That means the, the growth and the opportunity and the dividend paying stocks have yet to, to really emerge, but obviously the growth side of that, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. We're going to look back and go, I can't believe, you know, we could have seen some of these names and had the opportunity to buy them here in 2017 or 2018. Uh, and then and that's, and that's, let me add something to that, Kenneth, because that's very important for the person who is saying, you know, I want to have these core holdings for 30 years. I, I want to have some things that I think are going to go up dramatically over that time. Well, what you do is you look for moments like today uh, where we have uh, cannabis stocks getting pretty big, you know, pretty hit after the legalization in Canada, kind of the, a lot of people sold on that news and we've seen a lot of cannabis stocks come down. We have a cannabis report on our website you can go to followthemoney.com and you can see all the different reports we have. We have one on cannabis where we share our favorite cannabis stocks and then also cryptos, you know, which are currently uh, uh, very depressed price wise, relatively speaking. And they're also demonstrating very little volatility. So they're in that zone where they may end up breaking out or breaking down from here. But it's in moments like this where there's a lot of blood in the streets that you take those positions for the longer term. Um, and so, so while we may, we may, you know, as traders, we may say, oh, you know, we should buy it this week and then maybe it doesn't make money the next week and we, we throw our hands in the air. 
But from a longer term perspective, you know, this is the kind of environment that you're looking for to, to make those, uh, to take those positions in these uh, kinds of industries. 100% agreed. Well, I'd love to get your thoughts here on gold. We've seen gold come up uh, pretty significantly today. I mean, we're at 1230. It's not a very exciting price considering, you know, where we were, what, seven, eight years ago. Uh, you know, $1,900 gold, but we have come up and, you know, I'd like to get your thoughts here on the trend. What are we seeing? Obviously it's up from its low that we saw in 2015. We've never gone back to that low. Uh, and, you know, we kind of have these quick spike ups to 1350 or so, and then it seems to just teeter off from there. And, you know, here we are again at, at 1230. So uh, what are your thoughts on gold at the moment? Is this something you're bullish on long-term? I, yes, uh, long term, of course, because of the debt based currencies that we have, the fiat based currencies, which, you know, uh, the United States government is borrowing more now than it ever has. Uh, the same people who are barking about how bad spending was underneath the Bar uh, President Barack Obama's uh, presidency have suddenly gone silent. Hey, Kenneth. Have you seen any uh, Tea Party types complaining about the national debt or the deficits lately? I don't think so. <laughs> they tend to only care about that whenever their party is not in power. And the fact is, is that I'm long-term gold because I know that the amount of debt in the system is going to crash the system. I know that. I mean, it's just a matter of time. It's, a, it's literally mathematics. And so, so gold is a way to hedge against that. But in the near term right now, this is one of those moments, again, for people who don't have a, a core gold position, this is the perfect time. Or for those who do, this is a good time to be, in my, in my personal opinion, I'm not giving advice, but in my own personal opinion, as I look at the chart, this is a time where you begin consolidating or add to your current positions. The key area we're watching on the gold chart is the price, 1238. Uh, 1238 is where we found support. Uh, many, many, many months ago and rallied off. Since that time, we broke below 1238, and that's been a really key area of resistance. We just rose up to 1238 in October earlier this month, and we got bat down right back again. And as you mentioned, we're about 1230. Uh, we haven't seen gold break out even in this big equity sell-off because I don't think this equity sell-off is uh, and I could be wrong, but I don't think, it doesn't look like to me, having been through, you know, I've been trading for 20 years. So I, I traded through the dot-com bubble. I got my, cut my teeth on the dot-com bubble. And then uh, the, I traded through the 2008 crash, called that one, of course, that was our claim to fame. But, but, but as we look at what's happening now, this doesn't look like a, the beginning of a, of a major uh, collapse of the stock market. This looks like a really logical pullback because the stock market, as we mentioned, is a reflection of expectations. And right now, uh, again, I despise bringing politics into this conversation, but literally we have the midterms we can't ignore. They're, they're next Tuesday. And the stock market is very smart. Obviously, it's a reflection of, of expectations. And it's expecting the Democrats to take the House. Uh, it's also, there's a slight little potential that the Democrats could also take the Senate. It's a very small possibility, but it could happen. And the stock market doesn't like uncertainty. So up until this point, both uh, the Republicans have controlled all, part, all, all houses. They've controlled the Senate, the Senate, the House, and the White House. And uh, there's, there's a fear in the market that that's going to change. And if the Democrats do take over the House, that means that they have the power to launch committees. And they could get Trump bogged down in a whole bunch of, you know, uh, of uh, investigations. And that to the stock market is not good news. That's not, that's not the kind of news that they want to hear. Uh, they want certainty. And so I think the stock market is pricing in a Democratic victory of the House. I don't think it's pricing in a Democratic victory of the Senate. Therefore, on Tuesday, uh, if we have, and this is what we're telling our members, I'm not going to give you the exact thing, but uh, because there's a very big possibility that if, if the, uh, uh, the Democrats don't take the Senate, if they just take the House, then it's very possible that we could see this market rebound because then it's all kind of, it's all kind of known at that point. They may not be really excited, but it'll all be known. If we have this blue wave that some are hoping for uh, and we see actually the Democrats take both the House and the Senate, 
I think you could then see the stock market hurdle even lower. And then there's, of course, there's one more uh, uh, option, and that is the Democrats don't take anything. And if the Democrats don't take anything, and if, if the Republicans main, can maintain control across the board, then I think you could see a lot of conviction buying as people realize that the status quo is going to remain intact. That status quo may not be great, but at least it's certain. And I think you would see this kind of jittery stock market rally on that news. So I think a lot hinges upon Tuesday, the, the uh, midterms, and I think a lot of what we've seen in the sell-off is directly related to the price of equities readjusting in a logical manner to this new uncertainty uh, that may be uh, arising. So, um, it, but let me just finally bring that back to gold now, because gold, um, that's why I don't think we saw gold break out too much in this sell-off, because it was a logical sell-off. It wasn't a panic sell-off. It was a logical sell-off. And so gold is just kind of still churning. Uh, we do believe it's going to run eventually. We own gold. We have a core position in gold. We have a core position in silver. And we're long-term uh, believers in uh, hard assets. But in this environment, it's just a good place to accumulate. There is no long-term trend. There is no even a position trend on the weekly chart. This thing is completely uh, in a downtrend still. And 1238 is the very first area of resistance that we want to see violated before we even become at all slightly excited about the current trend in gold. Well, uh, that's a powerful thing. And, and that's a reason to definitely visit your website prior to uh, the election here when we'll be sure to get this interview out uh, sooner rather than later. That way it's not old news by the time uh, we have this election. Uh, but if people want to learn more about what you do, um, please remind everyone about the website and maybe just a little bit more. I mean, I think people got a good idea of, of the service you provide, but anything else that you'd like to add for people to uh, visit you and what they can expect to find? Sure, yeah, I'm a former financial advisor. Uh, I'm an economist by trade, studied economics at the university level and then did a lot of economic consulting with different businesses and, and whatnot over the years. In 2010, uh, I started followthemoney.com, which you called FTM Daily. It used to be called FTM Daily. Uh, it took me forever to buy followthemoney.com. Somebody was squatting on that domain and I couldn't get it, but I finally got it. And so followthemoney.com is our website. And uh, there people can come and they can become a free member. We have a bronze membership. We have bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, right? We love the precious metals. And so, so bronze is a free membership. And there you can come and you can get access to our market tracker where we tell you what the current trend of the stock market is. It's very helpful for people who have 401ks or IRAs and they like to kind of adjust their, their buying and selling based upon the current market trend. Uh, so that's really nice. We have a free podcast we put out on a regular basis. We interview some of the top minds in the economic space. And on top of that, we have, we have premium membership. So if you're, maybe you're looking for a new trading idea every single day delivered to your inbox or by text, you know, one of the, one of the latest trading ideas we're spotting, or maybe you want access to our cryptocurrency portfolio with alerts on when we buy or when we sell, or maybe you want to see which cannabis stocks we like and which ones we're going to be buying or which ones we're going to be selling. Or maybe you want access to our trend trading software. We've actually created a trend trading software where you can type in any stock or any crypto or any currency or any commodity and instantly see, is it in a long-term uptrend or is it in a long-term downtrend? And then you can, you know, basically take a lot, what a lot of our members do, uh, Kenneth, is they subscribe to many of these other newsletters that put out stock ideas. And then they use follow the money in our, in our trend trading software to type in those stocks and see, is it time to buy or is it still in a, mired in a downtrend? And they wait for the momentum to begin on that stock before they add. So, so we end up being a really great place to turn to when you're looking for ideal entries and exits on your, on your stocks or ETFs or whatever you're trading. But we provide so much education. We have a live Tuesday and Friday uh, coaching call that we do with, with our members. And so we give you, during the market hours, we're here to provide help and you can ask questions. So we have so many services. The best, place, best thing to do is just go to followthemoney.com and uh, just become a free bronze member to start out. And then from there, you can decide which, which membership is best for you. Jerry Robinson, everyone. Jerry, thanks for coming on Crush the Street and sharing your insight with us and, and just taking the time with me today. Absolutely. It's my pleasure, Kenneth.
All right, friends. Well, welcome back to the final moments here of our broadcast. Great to have you along for the ride today. And as always, I like to leave you with a final word. I can't think of anything more appropriate this time than Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7, which says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. It is a spiritual truth that debt, while it may not be a sin in the Bible's terms, is certainly dumb. It's a dumb idea. And we can certainly see the ramifications of debt here in our own country. It's something that we all should take heed to listen to and something to think about. Remember, friends, when you want the truth, just follow the money. A safe and prosperous week. And we'll see you right back here next time. Until then, God bless. All of the information contained on the Follow the Money podcast is strictly for informational and educational purposes. It should not be construed as specific investment advice. The views and opinions of our guests and sponsors, including Tom Cloud, are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of FTMDaily.com or Robinson Media Group, LLC. Jerry Robinson does hold an insurance license and at times may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products. Follow-up, individualized responses to email or phone requests that involve the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation will not be made absent compliance with state investment advisor registration requirements or an applicable exemption or exclusion and applicable insurance regulations. Past performance is not indicative of future results. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussion on the podcast. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence and always consult a trusted financial professional before making any financial decisions.